On this episode of Hands on Cars, Kevin buffs the Z sled and visits the AACA Museum in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Hey guys, Kevin Tate's for Hands On Cars. This is Project Z Sled, and it's painted for the most part. It's been sanded and buffed, and we've used surface correction techniques, um, but we wanted to show you more of that. I want to pass on some really strong, very valuable, and important information on surface correction techniques. It's obvious that this car has been sanded and buffed. The panels are very flat. The gloss is fantastic. The image quality is very good. I'm very proud of it. However, a trained seal can buff a flat panel. What I wanted to show you was the subtle nuances of curved parts. Big panels, not so much of a problem. Here's the gold. Take a look at the front bumper cover, known as a front fascia, fancy word for, well, front bumper cover. This is anything but flat. There's all kinds of crazy shapes. There's nooks, crannies, valleys, peaks, edges. All of these are danger zones, and there's a technique to rubbing something out like this because as important as it is to get the flat parts shiny and smooth, it's equally as important to get the curvy, sexy parts shiny and smooth, otherwise it doesn't match. Now this might look shiny on video, and it is shiny, but it's not the same. We gotta have our surface match, and here's where you start. Now to do this job, we're gonna be using a combination of Eastwood sandpapers and the Norton liquid ice buffing system. We'll get to the Norton system later, but I wanted to show you these sandpapers. These come in convenient packs of six sheets, so you don't have to buy a whole expensive sleeve of paper, and they range from 600 grit all the way up to 2,000, and then we go to a 3,000 Trizact paper. Now, Trizact is really interesting technology. The grit on the paper itself, well, it, it's triangular shaped. That's where it gets its name, and it's got a bit of a foam backing to it, so it makes it very forgiving and very fine, very precise. It almost puts a gloss into it, but the beauty of this is that it makes it polish so much faster and so much easier. It's a perfect final stage to just about any color sanding and buffing project. Now we're using water. These are wet or dry papers. Water is just kind of what you do with wet sanding and buffing. Well that made a lot of sense. So we're using a mixing cup with water in it and a couple of drops of dishwashing liquid. That helps lubricate the paper, it helps it shed of the slurry, and it just makes a nicer job of sanding and buffing. Now the truth is we've got grits from 600 to 3000 grit. We don't need all of this. We have a very smooth surface thanks to the Concourse Pro 2 spray gun and the Eastwood paint products. So we're gonna start at 1500 grit, go to 2000 grit, and then finally 3000 grit. We'll show you all of those steps. But the first step is to soak your paper. Now, technically, is it required? I don't know. Does it make the paper last longer? Yes, it does. There's a sheet of 1500. I'm gonna go ahead and pre-soak all of my paper. The biggest thing that pre-soaking the paper does, and you can see this in action on the Paintrication Color Sanding and Buffing DVD, is that when you fold your paper, for instance, when it's dry, if you fold it and crease it, sometimes you can create a rough edge. With it wet, never happens. And the Trizac, well, we'll deal with that later. I'm folding my paper into thirds, which does a couple of things. It gives me a smaller piece of paper to work with, and it allows me something to where I get a bit of traction with my fingertip pads on the surface. Microfiber holds the water nicely. Make sure you've got enough clear coat on the panel to sand in the first place. I've got three wet coats on Z sled, and I know I've got enough on the panel so I won't sand through, but you still need to be careful mostly on the edges and peaks. All I'm after is leveling the surface. But you want to be careful that you don't get your sandpaper in a place that your buffer won't be able to follow. Now one of my rules is never finger sand. Never <laughs> use your hand to sand, except for when you've got a surface like this. I'm always making sure I've got plenty of lubrication under the paper.
Now we can read our surface, see where we still have to sand. Now these areas right in here, obviously, well, we've got a little more sanding to do because that's unsanded and that's, well, this is sanded. So I should mention that you have to stop sanding at some point. So once your surface is flat, well, you're kind of done and you're ready for the next step of paper. Don't go all crazy and sand through to the base color because then you got to repaint. That's never fun. Makes you angry. In case you're wondering, this white slurry that's coming up, that means that you're sanding on a clear coated surface. It will be white regardless of the color because you're sanding the clear and that's what's coming up. Now in these areas here, the top of this fascia right here where I haven't sanded it, I'm not going to. There's almost no paint on that edge so I'm purposely avoiding that edge. Places like this right here, well there's a little bit of texture showing through. Needs just a little bit more sanding there. Now, if you've got more than one panel to do at one time, which most people do, um, I recommend treating it like an assembly line. I'm done with 1500 on my front fascia. Let's move over to the back, stay on the same grid. It helps me keep track. Again, this is a very smooth surface. There's almost no trash in it because we cleaned the heck out of it and we had a nice clean booth environment. So really, we're just after surface correction, smoothing it down. So 1500 on this is gonna be perfect. Another thing that using your paper soaking wet and pre-soaking it does is it makes it last forever. I'm not putting down very much effort. I'm just gliding the paper over the top of the surface. It doesn't take a whole lot, especially with fresh clear, to level it out, really make it smooth. Once I see a little bit of white slurry coming up, it's time to check. You can see quite well where I've sanded, and more importantly, where I haven't. Now pay close attention here. I have not sanded this peaked edge, and I'm not going to. You don't want to. There's not enough clear coat on that surface to effectively withstand that buffer after it's been sanded. You want to leave those pure. The gloss won't reflect in it. You'll never know the difference. Leave those areas alone. Here's a technique that I can show you on the top edge here. Okay, so my thumb, well, my thumb is my sanding pad. So we're gonna do a dry run here. Look where my thumb's going. It's exactly where I wanna sand. This area is visible. The tail light doesn't quite cover it. So I wanna make sure that there's no discrepancy in this surface and that surface. So I'm kind of practicing just to see where my thumb's gonna go. So now that I know, now I can take my sandpaper and effectively surface that area down. That's what we're doing, we're surfacing. It's surface correction. All those guys that said you don't need to buff a paint job, they've probably never buffed one out and seen the benefit of doing that type of work. With a closer look, I've achieved my goal of staying off of that peaked edge and leveling what I want to level and creating the environment that's gonna give me the illusion that I've dipped this stuff in glass. That's what we're after, a machined, corrected surface. So that should take care of the 1500 grit. So now that we're done with 1500 grit, I'm gonna take care of my 1500 paper. There's lots of life left in this paper, so I'm gonna set it down here, let it dry out, on a microfiber, and it's ready to sand another day. And since we pre-soaked our 2000 grit paper, it's ready for me to fold into thirds without the worry of creating a crease that can profile or put a scratch in my surface that I don't want. So basically 2000, you sand over top of what you sanded with 1500 grit. Second burst, same as the first, 2000 grit. Rock and roll, baby. Typically, the second stage with a finer grit doesn't take as long as the initial grit does. So 2000 is not gonna take you as long to surface down as your 1500 did because you're not cutting that ultra hard surface. You're cutting, well, into the resin base, technically, that is offering you less resistance.
Again, stay off those edges. It's just going to break your heart if you have a sand through, which means a repaint or touch up paint, some other kind of paint. And we're sanding, we're not painting. Be careful. Now the Trizac, like I said, has a bit of a foaminess to it. So it's very, very forgiving if you're sanding over peaked edges. Besides the fact that it's 3,000 grit, 1,000, it's very, very fine. And it goes a long way. It'll last you 40 forevers, especially if you take care of it and rinse it out after use. So with all that considered, I'm cutting mine in half and using this as my sanding pad. Now, I don't have to pre-soak the Trizac because, well, it kind of takes its own water supply on and you can fold it and bend it any way. And also, in case you're wondering why I'm only doing half of the fascia, I want to show you the difference between sanded and buffed and not sanded and buffed. Both look good, one just looks better. With the 3000 grit, typically I run over it about four times. Treat every panel or every chunk of a panel like a zone. That's twice. Make my way back on it. That's three times. Then I've got my four times. Licking a promise for good effort. And I move on to the next part. You can see how beautifully this paper it's even paper. How beautifully it conforms to these inner crevices and surfaces. Unless you've done it, you don't know what I'm talking about, but you can feel the resistance under your fingertips and you can kind of tell just by feel after a little while when something's sanded. All these areas that we spend so much time avoiding, all the peaked edges, well, the 3000 grit Trizact, all it's doing is getting rid of a layer of sanding scratches. It's profiling almost nothing. It's getting rid of almost no clear coat. So uh, I am avoiding those peaks, but I'm not really being careful. I don't have to. If you take just a little bit of time and clean out your sandpaper and your Trizac pads, they're going to be perfect the next time you reach for them and ready to use again. You'll get so much more life out of them. You guys have heard me talk about the Norton Liquid Ice system before, and basically it's a very, very simple system that works extremely well. I use it all the time. As a matter of fact, the Color Sanding and Buffing DVD by Paintrication features this system. It's a single compound with multiple pads. You start out with a wool pad to cut your sanding scratches. Your secondary pad is a blue pad, which is a coarse grit, but it still refines the scratches that the wool pad put in it and further refines and refinishes the surface, followed by a final step of a very fine grade foam pad, last step. The big machine we're going to be using is the Eastwood Buffer. The thing I like about this the most is the soft start. Listen. It's a soft start. It's going to start slowly. It's variable speed. Not that you'd ever buff that fast, but it's nice to know that you've got some R's to work with and if you want to build a little heat into the surface. But bottom line is this machine works very well. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about was where not to use this machine. And that's where this one comes in handy. It's this three inch buffer from Eastwood. Same liquid ice compound, the same three steps, wool, coarse foam, and fine foam to finish up. It's a very small buffing pad, but the biggest difference is that you've got a nice rolled edge in which to get inside tight areas to where you're not gonna dig in, you're not gonna damage, and you've got a very controllable piece of equipment here to get into, into all those little crevices and cracks and nooks and you're not gonna mess up. Now obviously it stands to reason that you can use a big polishing surface like this on a flat area. Even these guys here, you can bring it around, but once you start to get inside a cove like that, well, at 1500 RPM, you're going to pull the paint off the edges, not what you want. And that's where this guy comes in, and you can take it anywhere you want to go. And you can polish in these areas here. 
and not break your own heart. It's a beautiful thing. Yes, I'm wearing an apron. No, I'm not cooking. Don't even talk to me. Okay, so we've got an area about the size of a quarter on the big flat surface. You can always put more on. Start with about that size. I like to smoosh it around a little bit. Buffer RPM can vary, but you always want to start out slow. Typically, I'm going to buff around 1400 to 1600 RPM, but if I'm in a tight spot or around a fragile edge, I will slow down. The important thing to remember is not to dry buff. This builds heat and that can roll the clear right off of an edge. Now I can check the surface with a clean microfiber. And I'm happy with that. That took seconds to bring up the gloss. Got a little bit of haze around the edges here, but it just brought it up quickly. That's the power of that Trizac. That's beautiful. So I'll give it a second application and move on. When the surface starts to look like it's getting dry, well, it's getting dry. Time to use a little more compound. So 99% of air tools operate in a clockwise manner. Here's where you can outsmart your tools and your paint. This is gonna spin that direction. You want the buffer rolling off of the edge of the panel. So you're gonna operate like this, and that way it doesn't go against the sharp edge that we've avoided so carefully. It rolls off of the end of it, and you really lessen the chance that you can roll the paint up or burn through that edge, like so. With both the large and small diameter of the blue pad, you can still cut some of the sanding scratches that the wool pad didn't quite get, and it further refines the surface, making it a second stage out of three. Now the last stage is really not very time consuming at all. You're just kind of getting rid of a little bit of haze that might be left over in some corners. And the white pad is very, very soft. It's a polishing pad instead of a cutting pad, if that makes sense. We switch to the other tool because we're smarter than our hound tools. We are. Now you notice I've left a little bit of haze right here. That's not an accident. I never dry buff. I always leave a little bit of film on there and that's where this stuff comes in. This is a cleanup and a detail spray from Norton. And it's body shop safe, it's non-silicone, and it's the next step in cleaning off your panel and really getting a good look at what's going on. And I know you've got microfibers. If you don't, you can get them from the dollar store. 
Guess how much they cost? That's right, a dollar. It's a must-have tool, it just is. And as you're polishing this stuff out, you can look, you can watch, you can see the reflections, you can see what you missed, what you've still got to work on, and what you're happy with. Now, I'm real happy with what we've done here. I can see a huge difference, and I want to give you a closer look. Here, look at the quality of the reflection. Look at the distinctness of image. It's called DOI in our industry. At the quality of the reflection, you can see what was a very smooth finish laid down by the Concourse Pro spray gun and against this polished and machined surface. It's a night and day difference, especially on a black vehicle. Hands-On Cars is brought to you by the Eastwood Company. When you're restoring a car, truck, or motorcycle, Eastwood has everything you need to do the job right. Eastwood, since 1978. There's so much to see here. All kinds of beautiful pre-war cars, all restored, some original, back from when a time where there was true coach builders around. Speaking of coach builders, this is actually a 1924 Rio and it is a funeral coach. And people are dying to get in this ride. As a matter of fact, uh, they were doing it with a little bit of a buzz because this thing was actually converted to haul liquor illegally during Prohibition. This is awesome, it's a beautiful represented piece of history, but that's not what we're here for. There's an Indian display downstairs we gotta go check out. The very first Indian motorcycle prototype was built in 1901. They made six bikes that year. So it's great to see fully restored versions, but what really lights me up are these unrestored originals. The 1907 Indian, 1906 Indian Camelback. These are touched only by time. This is a restoration manual wrapped up in a motorcycle. And the fact that nobody's ever had these apart, it's just awesome to see. But one of the coolest things that we've seen here is this Briggs & Stratton motor wheel. Check this thing out. Briggs & Stratton may best be known as a manufacturer of quality engines for lawnmowers and minibikes, but in the early 20th century, they were a manufacturer of automotive accessories and made a large investment in their company to diversify into production vehicles. They purchased the rights to a buckboard-type vehicle called the Smith Motor Wheel and then increased its engine output by doubling it from 1 to 2 horsepower. Wow. And then renamed it the Briggs & Stratton Flyer. This machine was produced from 1919 to 1923, and this Model J Flyer had a base price of $175, about the cost of a monthly Starbucks bill. It's just a really cool machine. I love the fenders and little gas tank, and the fan to cool it. And how about the bucket seats and all the wood? And get this, when you start the engine, the drive wheel is always running. The shifter isn't really a shifter, it just simply is a lever that lifts the rear drive wheel off the ground for neutral and puts it on the ground to go, kind of like an engineered burnout. Because when the engine is running, the drive wheel is always turning. So you might be wondering how it stops. Well, when you push the brake pedal, it presses the fender against the tire, kind of like getting your foot caught in the spokes, and we all know that that can be a tad dramatic. These motor wheels were actually considered roadworthy back then. Now here's a beauty, a 1906 Indian Camelback. Not camel toe, Camelback. Indian produced their first motorcycle in 1901 and had begun production by 1903. By 1906, they were able to produce 1,698 of these Camelback motorcycles in a year at the cost of $210 each to the customers. The name Camelback wasn't actually the official name of this bike, it was actually a nickname given to it years later because of the humped fuel tank behind the seat. It has a diamond frame, like those used on bicycles, but this model is a chain drive, unlike many early bikes which used leather drive belts. This single cylinder engine was claimed to have put out two and a half horsepower while weighing only 115 pounds, which means it could push you along at 50 miles an hour. Pretty impressive back then. Now let's check out some of the other bikes in this cool exhibit. 
Now, the heart of Indian motorcycles is its race heritage. These things were born to run, and this 28 hill climber, well, the guy riding this thing had to have serious cojones. Check it out. There's no shocks. There's no brakes. It's a V-twin flathead engine that all it's going to do is propel somebody forward up a hill. No brakes. No shocks. It takes, <laughs> it takes a real man to ride that sucker up a hill. Now, a lot of people don't know, and what I didn't know until I came here, is that Indian was right there alongside Jeep and Harley Davidson, helping turn the tide in World War II. But out of these bikes, this is the one that got my attention. It has skis. Why does it have skis? I don't know. They're outriggers. It's got a big knobby rear tire. Obviously, it's meant to propel this motorcycle in a freaking snowdrift. I grew up in Canada. I've never seen this. My guess is that coming home from a pub one night, if you go into a snowbank, this will help you keep upright. But wow. What an interesting piece of history that is. That's wacky. Man, there's tons of stuff to see here. And they're constantly changing the display, so you never see the same thing twice. You owe it to yourself to come to the AACA Museum here in Hershey, Pennsylvania. For us, we've seen enough eye candy. It's time to go back, get back to work on the Camaro. After one more scene of the movie. Oh, you're kidding me. Well, I hope we've given you a little bit of insight as to what it takes to go from a nice-looking daily driver right out of the spray gun to a possibly award-winning show car finish that you can do in your garage. This is a bit of a learning curve, but it's not much. Go to eastwood.com, subscribe to the Zed Sled Project and our YouTube channel, uh, go to the tech support. We've got tons of videos showing you how to do this stuff, uh, how to do the job right. That's our motto at Eastwood. So thanks for watching Hands on Cars. Thank you for watching the progress of Project Zed Sled, and I can't wait to show you how much, <laughs> how much fun you can have building your own car like this. Oh, it's bringing it back. We're getting closer. See you next time.